Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 396 that's 396 of the Agostino Zynga show how you feeling how you doing good amazing great how am I you know just hanging on in there hanging on in there as best as I can if it's the first time checking out the show via YouTube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast that please download the show and share it with all your friends all that support is much appreciated here we are another week in it we're now in what November officially I think I'm not gonna date the podcast so we're in some you know some god forgiven god forsaken date in November the year is not only zipped by it's absolutely flown by right it's gone by you know faster than the speed of sound one moment it was july and we we're all thinking about whether or not we should go on that cheeky trip to lanzarote whether we should stay at home and now all of a sudden boom winter lockdown not doing absolutely anything and we're now staring at the prospect of essentially not being able to leave our home souls until mm, maybe february of next year if anything april may june july of next year absolute madness isn't it um if ever there was confirmation that summer is over, this is it. This is definitely it. If you're on the fence thinking, oh my God, actually, you know what? It might be all right. People are overreacting. We can probably scrape by all this. To get out. Any sort of optimism you had prior has left the building. Optimism has now left the building. That's what it should be. Um, pessimism should have been your number one uh, way of looking at things and viewing it. I know I did. I think I kind of wrote off the year back in March I was thinking you know what I write it off in terms of being able to do the things I enjoy to do but not in terms of the world completely being shut down which it feels like it still is right obviously you know stuff is still moving around if you want to order a pair of shoes you can probably still get them are you I know you can because I've ordered a couple but for the most part in terms of you being able to I don't know go to Disneyland Paris and feel at ease it's probably not the best time to probably even be in Paris you know let alone go there for Disneyland so um it looks like even my pessimism wasn't necessarily as high as it should be because I had assumed we would have been in some sort of after effects of the lockdown I thought we'd have still been you know um grafting away at it, but I didn't think it'd be going you know this late into the year which is now looking like it's probably going to be um later on to next year or things considered you know um most likely with these sort of systems when you turn it off or when you get especially when the people in charge get some kind of level of control and authority it's very difficult for these guys to kind of turn it back over to the populace and say here go back and do what you're doing prior so i assume fair estimate would say to me for you to go and do what you were doing let's say hmm let's say September of last year, whatever you were doing September of last year and how you're moving around, for you to get back to that level, I'm going to say September 2022. That's my um, bet. I don't think it's even September 2021. I think they're sort of like honey dicking us in general, especially here in the UK and most parts of Western Europe. I think they're trying to be as optimistic as they can to give us hope so we don't all revolt. But I think the more sensible um estimate as to when you can go back to doing what you were doing last year which was 2019 in september i would say the earliest you're going to get that is 2022 september definitely 100 percent. there's no way we're going to be back to any kind of quote-unquote normality by next year 2021 that's not happening anyone telling you that is selling you an absolute dream which is making me wonder why i guess if you're primavera if you're coachella and stuff you kind of always have to leave the door open because you can't technically cancel the thing on your own because if you do then you have you incur some crazy penalty fees i'm assuming you kind of have to let it kind of run its course and then you know essentially declare it a cause of what was that force of uh nat force of nature right or whatever one of those kind of events that's out of your control and then i'm assuming that way you can then claim some insurance money or you know make sure you're not liable to pay certain penalties blah 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 but anyone telling you that you can go to i mean because i got I even got an email from bloody um afro nation telling me oh yes yeah, sign up for our festival in 2021 we've got chris brown headlining i'm thinking chris brown who do you really like chris brown of course for chris brown optimistically he'd want to sign up for anything right any occasion for him to get out of the house and perform and do what he's been you know he's got given talent and sort of like decreed upon him i understand it but as a fan as a punter 
for you to really sit there and think you're going to be able to go to Portugal and, and enjoy Afro Nation is nuts. Nutty, nutty, nutty. So don't expect that. Don't expect Coachella. Don't expect Primavera, Glastonbury, all these things until 2022. But I'd love to hear your predictions regarding it. Um, let me know in the, in the comments down below. When do you think we're going to get back to some sort of level of normality? Do you think next year? Do you think early next year, middle, late? Or do you think um, what I think, which is probably going to be uh, what autumn of 2022? I'm probably going to put some money on it too because I want to put my money where my mouth is. I want to have some skin in the game. But I definitely think... Um, you know, governments will be will reluctantly give us back our civil liberties um, um, sometime in 2022. Until then, we're going to be living under the thumb of whatever government we are currently residing in. Anyway, enough of all that stuff. Politics is boring and gay. Let's get onto the actual real topics at hand, things that are really important in this day and age. Oh, so um, United ended up losing 1-0 at home to Arsenal, which is typical of us, right? We end up thumping our Red Bull Leipzig in the Champions League. And then we somehow managed to lose against a pretty crap Arsenal team at home um, in a very sloppy uh, way. We gave away a penalty, which is kind of ironic considering the amount of penalties we won last season that eventually got us uh, to finish third, you know, by the skin of our teeth. But um, the performance probably... Less to say about it, the better. Well, Bamiang scored in what the 69th minute from a penalty kick. Um, there wasn't really much in the game, it was incredibly tight from the beginning to the end. Both managers or oh, both teams, you know, really um, kind of illustrating how far they've fallen off from the perch that they were on prior. prior. Um, in Arteta's case, he's having to work with a lot of players he hasn't necessarily bought or he hasn't necessarily. You know, yeah, he hasn't necessarily built the team in his image just yet. He's still implementing his tactics. But so far from that one game, we definitely have seen a vision of what Arteta is trying to do with um, Arsenal and how he's trying to, you know, um, bring the best out of the tools that he has available. Of course, we will know what's happened with Ozil. But so far, he's really worked out a great way to combine Lacazette and Aubameyang in the same team. I'm still not very much sold on Lacazette. I still think he's probably not of the level that Arsenal probably need ultimately if they want to go to the top. I think he sorted out the midfield partnerships and the combinations, especially with El Nene, who was quite possibly the best midfielder on the pitch, which is a real um, kick in the face, especially if you're Paul Pogba, especially if you're Bruno Fernandes. Having El Nene essentially run that game from the minute one to the last minute, especially if you've seen that video going around on social media of him pressing defenders, you know, until the very last minutes of extra added, added extra time, of, you know, after the 90, pressing Luke Shaw into passing the ball back to the goal keeper which you know he's always happy to do but you can see what Arteta's is doing there and I guess anyway let's start from the beginning I think the lineup wise for United I don't think anyone had any complaints right that we'll look at we'll look at this game in isolation and then of course we'll kind of it, I'll kind of talk about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tenure as United manager in general but in terms of lineup I don't think any United fan had any real complaints the back five picks itself. Of course, I would have loved Tellers to have played against Arsenal, but unfortunately he contracted coronavirus, which is, again, typical of our luck. So um, we had a midfield diamond of Fred, Mc Scott McTominay, Paul Pobb and Bruno Fernandes. And then we had a Mason Greenwood and a Marcus Rashford playing up front. Now, the... The formation obviously works. We saw it work pretty well against Red Bull Leipzig in the Champions League. Um, we have this understanding that we have probably midfielders that aren't necessarily specialists in any sort of role, but they're sort of, you know, they can kind of occupy different positions. You know, for the most part, I would assume most would agree. Scott McTominay, Bruno Fernandes and Paul Pogba can probably rotate and ranks each other in terms of who plays where in that midfield three. Maybe Fred is the only sort of like out and out defensive midfielder, maybe apart from Scott McTominay. I still don't think it's at his best position. But I say those three midfielders can work. That's completely fine. Um, but unfortunately, again, with Solskjaer and this team in general and the kind of the profiles of the players, it seems like these sort of players need a lot more coaching a lot more direction than maybe other players will do now as, as some managers will probably argue that most players need directions and an idea of what the manager is trying to do in, in order to implement it on a pitch but there is a distinct lack of personalities willing to step up and change things on their own on the field and sort of force the manager into making a tactical change um, you know, in kind of years gone by where managers and players were sort of like push themselves up. They take a different man on in the, in the box in terms of covering, just do these little tweaks 
because they see things differently when they're playing on the pitch that necessarily happened. So in the first 10, 15 minutes, it was quite clear that this formation with a diamond in the middle wasn't working, right? It wasn't working primarily because we have an imbalanced team in that if you're going to play this sort of diamond, you're going to need your fullbacks to provide the width. And if you're n they're not providing the width, you're going to need your players on you know, that are playing you know, on either side of that diamond to then push out onto the wings and block any sort of attacks coming from the right back and the full backs of the opposing side. And unfortunately for us, we had two players, especially in Paul Pogba's case, who were incapable and unwilling to cover their fullback and cover that position. So we were getting overloaded in the flanks. More so, I say, on, on Luke Shaw's end of things, because I think Arsenal identified that Luke Shaw was definitely the weak link in terms of our back line. But we were getting absolutely overrun in that on the flanks. Overrun, overrun, overrun. No cover being made. And again, you would prefer it if the players themselves would have made the decision to switch the midfield into a flat back four, into a flat four into a flat floor four sorry or to maybe get a couple of the players pushing further up in order to kind of push the Arsenal fullbacks a bit further back that didn't happen we ended up making Hector Bellerin you know look like prime bloody Roberto Carlos and we made Elneny look like flipping Sergio Busquets reincarnated typical of United um, formation so that didn't obviously work and then through that, a bit of a stalemate in terms of making sure we got the breakthrough. Um, De Gea pulled off a couple of smart saves. We had a couple of fin shots on goal. Most notably, maybe you might make some Greenwood chance. That wasn't really much of a chance. And the game was sort of petering out to a boring nil-nil conclusion until Paul Pogba, one of the midfielders who was tasked to occupying that left-hand side of the pitch, failed to pick up his man. Hector Bellerin wandered into the box, into a very innocuous position. You know, you don't really think Hector Bellerin's going to really cause any damage in the box. He doesn't have the dribbling, dribbling ability or the, or the you know final ball ability to really, really split our defenders. Paul Pogba decides to go harsh, rush, he rushes in, and clips him in the back of the foot. Bit of a soft uh, penalty, don't get me wrong, but I'm a big believer in all fouls in the box should be penalties. I don't believe in the fact that, you know, certain fouls in the box equal penalties and certain don't. Uh, it gets annoying when some referees are, you know, they sort of adjudicate that, oh, because this guy didn't fall as hard as he should have outside the box, it's not a penalty. I don't, I'm not a believer in that. So soft, don't get me wrong. But I still think it was a penalty. I think if that happened against United, our fans would be absolutely spitting feathers. Of course, Mike Dean was a bit inconsistent with his cards. But again, I don't like talking about referees. You can't control referees. They are sort of like, you know, the they're sort of like the last thing a team should be worrying about that's properly coached. In the end, we gave away the penalty and um, Aubameyang then goes and, you know, convincingly slots it away. The game is pretty pointless and useless having Duran to stop penalties. It's not the best, but in terms of shot stopping, obviously he's up there. And then from then on, you didn't really see us getting any, you know, thing, thing from the game. We made some really bizarre substitutions towards uh, the end of the game. I think, who did he take off? Did he take off? Um, he brought Edson Cavani, Manny Matic and Donny van der Beek for Greenwood, Fred and Maguire. No, Greenwood, Fred and Bruno Fernandes, respectively. And again, the game just petered out to an absolute standstill. Um, Arsenal were able to sneak the win. Probably fairly deserved to be able to bounce a play. You'd say they were probably... Even though the game was dead, I'd say Arsenal probably had the better part of the possession. They looked a lot more frightening, a lot more uh, purposeful when they did have the ball in our final third. Their passing was a bit more crisper. They had some combinations and some systems and some patterns that they were looking to kind of exploit. Saka obviously um, had a good little duel with one Saka on the right-hand side. I forgot who's... Oh, sorry, left-hand side. I forgot who's playing on the right. Uh, sorry, it's here. Isn't it? Hector Bellerin and William. William was pretty ineffective. He didn't really help any situation there. Bellerin did his job pretty well in terms of pinning up, pinning back our fullbacks, and of course, inevitably won the penalty. Um, and of course, you know Thomas Partey was you know doing what he did best in the midfield, but I still think El Nani was the best player. So going back again to Man United, I would say the issue at hand here isn't that this result is in isolation this is probably more of a representation of this current team's pers you know the personalities in this current team and of course the a level of ability to coach of this current manager there was a lot of excuses made about Solskjaer's tenure at United especially in the earlier past when our results are a bit inconsistent that he didn't have the players that he wanted that the players that he didn't want 
uh, at the club or still at the club stinking it up. He's been able to sell or let go of a few players. If you believe what you read, some of the players wanting to leave regardless. Lukaku and Alexis Sanchez being two of the biggest ones to point out. But let's re- let's believe the the kind of um, the line coming up from the club that he got rid of those players. He then got some players in. Now they weren't all the players that he wanted. If you again believe the reports in the papers, he missed out on a few players on his list. Sancho and Jack Grealish being one of two of the big standouts. But so far, he has got the majority of the players that he wanted. He has got a team full of personalities and players that he feels like are playing for him. He's made constant excuses about the boards, um, in, a, in our eyes, inability to sign players, but he thinks he's done a great job. And he's got the coaching staff that he's worked with, you know, that have got the best results at United during the time that he's been there. So these sort of results, there really is no excuse, especially when you look at the flow of the game. In the first 15 minutes, this formation wasn't working. Sosha couldn't change it. He couldn't affect the game in any way, in any sort of meaningful way. And then once the game was away from us, the changes came too late. And when the changes did come, there weren't the changes that you really wanted to see. And there are really loads of like simple mistakes that don't really make that much sense if you think about it, right? Like just in terms of what we're trying to do as a club going forward, the personnel and the profile of the players, this type of football that we want to play, there's so much, too much of a mismatch. And ultimately, I think, what needs to happen is that obviously we need to replace Solskjaer as manager. I don't think any United fan would look at himself in the mirror and honestly say that they think Solskjaer is going to be the manager to take us back to winning a Premier League title. Um, would, whether he could win us a trophy, of course, that's possible. Um, knockout tournaments, you know, um, our knockout tournaments, you can scuff your way towards a final. And if you get into a final, all bets are off in terms of who's the favourite and who's not, who doesn't have the best coach, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a final, anyone can win it. But in terms of sustaining um, a league campaign to challenge the, the the league winners or to basically, you know, go for the title ourselves, we're not doing it under Solskjaer because he requires too much, um, he requires too many resources to make that work. And unfortunately, under the current ownership, under the Glazers, under the stewardship of Ed Woodward, those resources are never going to become available. We had the same cycle with managers. I think someone made a graph about it on social media where we hire a manager, the manager finishes in fourth position. No, the manager finishes outside the top four. You give them money to finish in the top four. They finish in the top four. Then in order to build upon that, the team then decides to withhold the funds because they feel like they've got the, you know, they've got the Champions League funds or the Champions League uh, finishing uh, money already in the bank. And they basically uh, tie the hands back behind the manager's back and prevent him from building. And then we're in a cycle where they lose a couple of games and we sack them and hire another manager. That obviously does happen, but I don't think that is special. I don't think that is something that's only affecting our club. I think most big clubs in Europe who are trying to win big trophies are in the same sort of cycle that we're in, regardless if they have a really good football structure or not. Unfortunately, it's even worse if they have a good football structure and they have an actual vision in place, then there are no excuses, right? You look at Kovacic at Bayern Munich. He did a pretty good job. I think it was at Frankfurt prior and to joining Bayern Munich. He was given the reins at the club. He stunk up the place and didn't necessarily work out, even though stink up the place in Bayern Munich is like finishing, what, third or something, unacceptable like that. And then he gets fired pretty swiftly, right? And they bring someone else in. And this is a t- this is a club that has... That is probably, you know, some could argue maybe one of the best well best well run clubs in the world. You could probably put any manager in charge of that team and they'd probably finish in the top two of the Bundesliga or maybe they'd you know, they'd make sure they'd come um they progress out of the group stage of the Champions League. Fair enough. But if that occurs at Bayern Munich, why are we somehow exempt from that? Why are some of our Sam fan base so hell bent on protecting Oli, defending him at all costs when quite clearly he's demonstrated over a prolonged period in time that he's not the manager to get us to the next level. He was a perfect guy to come in after Mourinho. The best solution. Mourinho was toxic. Um, Mourinho kind of had the players arguing amongst each other. He created divisions inside the team. The backroom staff weren't happy. The person at the front desk wasn't happy. The mood was quiet, incredibly dour. That's what Mourinho did, right? And of course, maybe it was the wrong time frame at the time. Maybe he was going through some some stuff personally. Whatever the reason, Mourinho completely ruined the atmosphere at Man United. So hiring someone like Andrew Gunn Solskjaer made a lot of sense on an interim level, on an interim basis. But judging by what he's done so far, especially when since he's under contract, it's not really been the funnest of rides. We're now, what, 15th in the league? 
right? 15th in the league, 15th in the league, in the Premier League. And um, of course, we have this mythical one game in hand, which is against us, the Villa, and doesn't really matter considering how well they've been playing and how poorly we've been playing. Jack Grealish signed a new contract. You know he's aware of the interest that we've had in him. It's just all lined up for him to have an absolutely world of a performance anyway. So those things are not happening at the moment. And there's no other thing that we can do. We can't get rid of all the players. So the only person that has to go is Solskjaer, unfortunately. That is the nature of the beast. And I just don't understand why it's such a controversial opinion that some players or some, sorry, some supporters would want a proper football coach in who can improve the players that we have and maybe operate on a bit of a shoestring budget because that's, that's that's essentially what he's going to have to deal with under this current regime and under the stewardship of Ed Woodward. You're not going to get the money you want. You're not going to get the players you want and you're going to have to work with whatever you're given. And if that's the case, a Mauricio Pochettino's type of manager might be the best option for us now, especially, especially with the Glazers. Because if you're saying Solskjaer needs Sancho, Solskjaer needs him, also needs that person, that's never going to happen under the Glazers. If we do go and sign Sol- um, Sancho in January or in the next transfer window in the summer, that will end up being our only signing anyway. We're not going to go and sign three players after spending $120 million on a player we should have bought last season. That's not going to happen. So if that's the case, and we know that's not going to happen, we definitely need to get a football coach in who can coach these players because I refuse to believe these players are 15th um, in the Premier League level. They're not. We've seen what they can do against Robert Leipzig. We've seen what they can do against PSG. We've seen the level of performance that can be coached out uh, into this side. We just need a coach that can do it on a sustained period with the players and get the combinations right because... Maybe the Pogba situation does require him to leave. Maybe his time has run out at United, which I'm definitely agreeing with. I don't think he's necessarily pulled up any trees at United apart from that one sort of like purple patch he had, right? Maybe that's true. But what we need is a manager to come in and provide some alternative options to the way we line up. You know, not always just completely trusting and starting with the same back five in all different games the same shape in all games for the most part we kind of deviate between two or three formations we have the same individuals playing in the same positions we have the same combinations in midfield right and i get it managers have their sort of like they're going to go back to the things that work in prior in you know in sort of like the in the better times but considering how you know inconsistent we've been considering the fact that some of the players don't seem to be gelling as well as they should do on paper Let's find some more interesting solutions. I don't mind if Dwan Mata decides, you know, has to play on a right midfield of a 4 3 3 because he's the one to hold position the best. I don't really mind it. I just want there to be a direction and a clear idea about what we're doing. What I don't want is for a manager to come in like a soul shark, try and play all these best players at once, it not work, and then not make the necessary changes in order to kind of affect the game because he's already spunked his load on the lineup that's already starting. So yeah, and if ever there was a side you don't want to lose to, it's Arsenal. Their fan base are, their fan base is, it's just, you know, it's hard to actually tolerate how annoying their fan base are. They're just so, so, so frustrating to even talk to. So again, big up United for ruining my weekend as per usual. Um, Now we're going to what, who we're facing? We're facing um Istanbul in the Champions League. We're, we're most likely going to beat them 6-0 and then lose the following match in the Premier League as per usual. Nothing real will change after that until the manager's gone. Um, and if anybody's sat there thinking everything will change once Pogba leaves, I um, <laughs> I will, you know, I'm confidently can say if Pogba leaves, he will definitely win a league trophy before we do. That goes without a shadow of a doubt. Yet you can say, oh, because he'll be, you know, part of the flipping squad at Juventus. No, whatever. Whatever side he goes to, he'll win the league title before we do. Guaranteed. Especially if we keep Solskjaer. That's not going to change. But yeah, United lost 1-0 at home to Arsenal. Terrible loss. But again, probably well-deserved considering how poorly we're coached and how terrible our players are, really. You know, players don't really have any excuses there too. They all flip and stunk up the place. Of course, Pogba's going to get all the big headlines because he gave away the penalty. But no player on that pitch can hold their head high. Everyone was shocking from the back to the front, really. Maybe De Gea can maybe say he played, uh, you know, somewhat well. But everyone else, shocking a display from everyone there, especially considering the level of opponent we're facing. But hey-ho, what can we do? Moving on in, moving on up. What else do we have here? 
What do you want to talk about? Oh, yeah, this is a good one. So, um, I finally, finally got my hands on Larry's Garage, the um, the documentary focusing on Larry Levan, Larry Levan, Larry Levine, Larry Levan, Larry Levan's um, life and career at the Paradise Garage in New York, um, a seminal disco and house nightclub that was what I, I'm gonna say opened in the late eighties. Yeah, right. Late eighties had a really short run. And unfortunately, um, Larry Levan as well ended up passing away fairly early in his life too due to various illnesses and complications with that and whatever it may be. But again, Paradise Garage, I'm sure most of you have heard of it, especially um, in recent years with the resurgence of interest. Mostly, I'm going to say, uh, due to the success of what um, Alex Olsen is doing at his brand, Bianca Chandon, he did a couple of t-shirts, I think, uh for benefits of larry garage uh, sorry uh, paradise garage he did a few other initiatives obviously the music he plays is very much lends itself to that place so you can see you know the, a lot of the influences of what larry levan did at um at paradise garage are definitely being felt even nowadays right in things that are going on and i don't know it was a very sobering um documentary for me to watch especially nowadays with the current conversation that's going around inclusion and discrimination and representation in nightclubs and in the dance community dance, well, the dance music scene and it was so cool to see um how much of a influence and a positive inspiration um larry levan was to so many different people when he's you know during his short time on this earth of course the documentary opens up with a few candid interviews with um larry levander that i haven't necessarily seen on youtube before um loads of really cool um sound bites from him talking about his ideas around night clubbing his ideas around providing a safe space about music about djing culture really loads of stuff that he said in the 80s that you can definitely um relate to the lessons that are kind of going on now in the scene so that was quite cool to see and again very rare footage in that regard and then as per the my documentary which i thought was the best one but i definitely think this one is the best best of the two larry's garage um they obviously went and interviewed a lot of the people that kind of played a big role in making paradise garage into what it was at the time and just people that kind of were loosely associated with that crew and it was so cool to hear about you know how much of a big role paradise garage played in cultivating the local community and the community worldwide right there's a bit about how big larry levan was in tokyo i mean in japan right regarding some of the music he was playing and of course you know they have some of the best fandom culture that exists in the world in japan but to see how far reaching his influence was before the internet that we know as it is today was incredible to see um to see how well regarded and revered he was to see of course the other bit as well that i didn't really wasn't familiar with uh, prior to watching the documentary was his how obsessed Larry was with sound in a nightclub he wanted the sound system at Paradise Garage to be the best sound system that ever existed and he kept going on and on about that there were some periods in, in the documentary where they were mentioning a little piece and pieces about um, Larry's you know uh DJing style and how sometimes he wouldn't necessarily always play the best set but he had the best selection but for the most part most of the stuff focused on the sound and the vibe and the overall feeling in the nightclub and it reminded me a lot of my time spent at Berghain my time spent at Robert Johnson my time spent at Sub Club and these kind of places right where you don't necessarily leave there with a recollection of who played and what they played you get more of a lasting memory of the ambiance the vibe the people right that you met in a smoking area the sound as you walked through as you kind of got past security that's what kind of you leave with and I think that's maybe a real good marker on the quality of a nightclub right if I guess if a place has to rely solely on the lineup or on the let's say the artistic direction of the flyer that some people have nowadays mm -hmm. then you know you're not in a great place and it's a shame really I think it's not necessarily anyone's fault I just think you know dance music culture has um, exploded DJing is are now you know bigger celebrities than they've ever been so this sort of reliance on making sure you build up names and hype names to sell tickets and to kind of get people through the door because I've kind of, you know, I work briefly at a ticketing company and most of the time, most of the sort of, you know, um, outline, even though I did a terrible job at that place, absolutely shocking job. But most of the kind of brief that we were given 
at that place was essentially to keep put well you know you, you were kind of in charge of making sure you got all the necessary details that you needed about the festival or the event that was going on but most of the push in terms of marketing it was mostly around the names about the announcement of names who was playing remind them who was playing showing them clips of them playing somewhere else but all about the names less so about the promotion even though even less so about the promoters involved about the space the time of year even it was all about the djs all about their personalities behind the decks and i guess that takes away a lot from the actual things that make a nightclub what it is isn't it the people that are in it the sound the location the vibe like i said before and it was cool to see such a such importance being placed on that side of things by Larry during that time. And I think a lot of the stuff that I see kind of, you know, in documentaries about Studio 54, about Mud Club, about uh, what else can I mention? You know, these seminal locations where sort of like scenes and musical careers were sort of birthed. They sort of all kind of have the same sort of ingredients, right? This kind of, you know... Um, uh, reliance and concentration and sort of like you know real dedication to cultivating a community sometimes at the you know at the detriment of the people that are left out right this sort of like kind of really clicky feel really benefits it a uh, really strong concerted effort to make it the best place ever for a short period of time right because you know the Paris Garage had a really short stint but an influential stint Studio 54 short influential but then you know you look at the, you look at stuff that happens in Europe with Robert Johnson with Sub Club with of course with um, Bergheim of course which is a legendary one to so keep mentioning I think they've sort of learned the lessons and the pitfalls of these places and kind of were able to avoid them because you know it's very rare you see clubs and establishments hang around as long as Bergheim has right and still be revered as they are very very rare but if you think about it <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with what happens behind the scenes the fact that they cultivate a community and a scene and a reverence behind the club with the people that actually play right so much so that people go out of their way to make sure they're on their best behavior when they're playing at the Bergheim right legendary stories about flipping what's his name Richie Horton getting banned and chucked out of there for being a bit of a lad behind the decks they don't have any favoritism they treat everybody that comes through the door the same and they really make sure that they're really picky about who's allowed to um you know populate their dance floor and a lot of those sort of like codes a lot of those uh things that i see in those kind of places i definitely saw uh reflected in larry's in the larry's garage or paradise garage specifically larry's garage documentary and it made me think you know most of these things that we're seeing nowadays in clubland none of it's new all of it's the same and the other thing, I kind of point out was your first. Oh, the other thing as well that was kind of heartbreaking about the whole situation was, of course, Larry's untimely passing, um, due to maybe uh, complications with um, excessive drug use. For the most part, a lot of people were saying that he didn't necessarily, he might not have had the monetary six, the monetary wealth that would maybe you'd expect of somebody of his stature. I think nowadays maybe that was maybe a consequence of the time that he grew up in but there was a real there was a real sort of like attitude hmm. there was a real kind of um i would say focus on artistry in the purest sense right in the 80s it feels like i don't know maybe um who was a good example they featured in the documentary what's his flipping name oh blah 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 that draw the sketch artist that draws illustrator that was around during um the paradise garage days keith herring keith herring might have been the first contemporary artist during that time who was the kind of contemporary version of what artists are now where they're sort of like half businessman half artist it feels like back then most of the people involved in the in the arts were artists first and foremost and businessmen second third or fourth so a lot of the things you heard for between the line between the lines were oh, that Larry was basically suffering a lot. His records always mysteriously got lost or misplaced, which in, in my opinion means that he was probably selling them to feed his habits or feed his addictions. And that's obviously disconcerting and really something that you don't really want to hear about somebody you look up to and revere that they were such in dire straits that they were having to sell their prized record collection to keep their fix. And then the other thing, of course, is this idea of getting lost in the source, isn't it? It's the iconic um, you know, Gucci Mane quote where I think he actually was lost in the source himself during this time. I don't know specifically what it was, but him mentioning, you know, don't get lost in the source, right? Like, don't stop thinking your suit don't stink or whatever it may be. And it maybe 
is a lesson that needs to be told. It's definitely something that needs to be reminded to people a lot more in the dance and music scene, especially because you feel as if careers in the scene go up and down so quickly. People, you know, have a grand opening and a grand closing. Um, and most of the time when you kind of think about the person and you think, oh, where's he and she gone? I haven't seen him in a scene that long. It's usually as a consequence of getting lost in the source and not really concentrating on the things that matter, the things that got them to the dance. And that's the real shame of it. I think it would have been great to have had Larry's voice and vision um, still around uh, in club land, especially in America, because I think of how far back America has sort of like fallen in terms of dance music culture and influence um, especially when you consider their rich heritage in nightclubs it really is a crying shame and you feel as if if somebody you feel as if sometimes whenever scenes die or people pass away and things change that the the, the sort of vibe and atmosphere sort of leaves with them unfortunately it's very rarely that they sort of continue on you know um, honoring the person's spirit and the place continues being the same naturally people just fall off of course most of it has to do with that sort of like four-year cycle thing that i think i'm going to get a book on soon um that sort of describes you know the 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 usual cycle of scenes and subcultures and whatever it may be it's usually around four years so regardless if the person that's that started it is around or not there's going to come a time when things just need to get refreshed and people move away they can lose interest bloody blah, blah 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 things can definitely change but it was just nice to see all of um, larry's old friends kind of gather around on the, his legacy and speak about how important um, paradise garage was them was to them during that time and it's a stark reminder for myself of course you know being in lockdown at the moment and having no possibility of going to a nightclub anytime soon probably i'm going to say until the autumn of um 2022 i think as to when we're going to be able to go out again but i'd like to be reminded of just the importance of clubs play in terms of cultivating you know scenes cultivating communities cultivating relationships uh whether they be personal or business they are really a breeding ground for all those things and it's a shame that we don't have them around the moment but again um a great documentary larry's garage directed by corrado riza it's available on uh vimeo now at the moment to watch on demand so click the link available in the description below you can click that and rent it there directly definitely recommend you check it out if you are obsessed with dance music as i am again it's called larry's garage it's available now um it's the story of larry levine larry levant sorry i always go larry levine i don't say larry levine the story of larry levant and the paradise garage definitely make sure you check it out i'll put the show the description or sorry the link to the show the link to the documentary in the show description so make sure you check that out if you've got a moment or two next on the list um what do we have here oh we have a pretty embarrassing moment for um, gospel singer trapper, gospel singer turned trapper Rod Wave had a bit of a tumble on stage uh, during, I guess, Halloween weekend. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think he posted a video recently, you kind of, you know, talking about, you know, kind of flexing on a gram and showing all the money he has basically not taking the joke seriously and sort of not really laughing at himself but essentially saying hey so what i fell through a stage i still have more money than you which is the usually the 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 easy comeback for somebody that feels embarrassed and doesn't necessarily have a witty or smart way to kind of embrace the meme personally for me looking at what he kind of going through there i've i can't say i've been in that position because i've never been that big but i know i'm at heaviest especially when you're a dude and you, I guess it's different for him because Rod Wave has that sort of face. He has a fat guy face, isn't it? He's got like a massive dome. So maybe he's always been that weight. But when you've, when you're a dude and you get to that weight and it's not something that you kind of, you know, were born with, it, you can feel really awkward in the body that you have now, of course, mostly due to your own poor dietary choices. But when usually, I don't know why it is, but you constantly get reminded, the world constantly reminds you of your size, whether you're going up an escalator, whether you're passing somebody in a shopping aisle, this, the world always gives you like small little reminders. You're fat, you're fat, you're fat shit, you're fat, you're fat shit, you're fat, you're fat shit. And this is not, this, is, this isn't a small reminder. This is a, uh, uh, a huge reminder, right? <laughs> no pun intended. And you'd love to think that these sort of things will be the thing that he needs to kind of you know get his life in order and get healthy 
but I just, I just, I don't think so. I think, judging by his reaction, I think he generally thinks that it's not a big deal, and it is what it is. But the internet never forgets, and this is prob- quite possibly one of the most embarrassing ways to kind of fall on the stage I've ever seen in my life. So let's play a video here. This is from DJ Academics' page. Let's get the sound on here so we can hear the full noise of it of him going through the stage. So of course, Rod Wave in the all blue, sky blue outfit. You know, hood favorite that sky blue walking on stage with his goons about to deliver a very ghetto-inspired uh, ballad, and this happens. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> and you see all ass crack, right? So he's walking on the stage with his whole entourage of goons. I'm not too sure why, a, again, a gospel singer trying trapper would need that many goons, but again, who knows what he's dealing with on that side of things. And if... If falling on the stage, if falling through the stage wasn't bad enough because you could say, hey, it was, you know, a big crowd, a big group of people, you know, we're rolling heavy, you know, no pun intended. But it's the fact that they all fell through because there's a lot of them. But then he also fell through himself. Like he put, he stepped and put a hole in the floor, landed on his back. And as he's getting up, he couldn't stand up by himself. So he's like a turtle. He's found his friends had to pull him up off the stage and then when he did stand up off the stage he showed his entire ass crack he had that he had that sort of like you know that ass crack you see when people are fighting on world star and you know some fat guy gets smushed and he's on the floor trying to gather himself and his whole ass is out that's always a common thing that always gets exposed when someone's fighting i don't know why it's a bum crack but jesus christus rod wave what a shocking way and this is a better angle a bit of a wide angle view of it from afar walking on stage See, his whole group goes down, right? As you can see there. And then as Rod Wave is walking f- forward, he steps on another bit. He tries to avoid the hole. And then he falls for another one. Jesus Christ, that's so embarrassing. And again, this would be the perfect sort of motivation you'd need to kind of lose a few LBs. Mm-hmm. I know I went through something similar when I, you know, went to like Unica, my heaviest. And this might have been, what? The, within the first couple of years or so of Unica opening in London and you know I was trying to you know when you're a big dude you don't really so I know when it was when I was that big you never buy new jeans you just always wear the same pair of jeans because you don't want to go somewhere and find out what your actual waist size is so I remember going into that shop and asking a sales assistant you know I need a new pair of jeans and sort of trying to I basically tried on every size that was available on the shelf and I couldn't find one that fit and of course, stupid naive me for oh they've got more on them back, and I didn't know. No, that's they only end at whatever size it was, thirty eight, whatever it was, right, or thirty seven. I don't know, whatever. And I and then I asked herself, says, "No, do you got any more bigger?" And she looked at me like she's like, "I'm sorry, honey. No, we don't. We don't necessarily do them for your kind of size." I was like, "My kind of size." And then immediately, when someone, it's a so weird, isn't it? So, we need things you don't see immediately as soon as I walked out of the store. And uh, when I got fat shamed by a retail assistant and I walked past the window, I immediately saw all my lumps and bumps. But prior to that, I didn't. I just thought, yeah, I'm a stocky guy. I'm a run ton. I mean, I'm blonk, so whatever it may be. But it only takes one person to point out something from you outside of your kind of bubble of comfortability, bubble of acceptance or whatever, whatever it is, or bubbles of compliments. It only takes one person outside of that to tell you something and suddenly like, oh shit, I can't unsee that. And then of course... Rod Wave's reply, typical rapper reply where he's sort of flexing they on the gram with the stacks of money. Oh, it's cool. Yeah, but we know you're rich. We, we we understand that. You have songs on Spotify that have got millions and millions of views. You get booked to play shows during a flipping worldwide pandemic. We know you got the money. That's not the case. People are laughing at the fact that, what's that? <laughs> Stage been broke so many times. <laughs> So the comments here, yeah, he got to pay all that for the stage damage he did. <laughs> now money ain't saving you with this one, of course. It's always money, yep. Number, what's this person say? Number one sign that shows that you've lost is when you show off your money, 100%. Um, is that money that you repair the stage? He said health is wealth, which is a really good one. <laughs> Rappers take one L and all of a sudden we got to see the money they make, yep. And he said to him, he hurt, hurt. He hurt on the inside, it's okay. You're gonna buy you're gonna buy so much McDonald's with that money. <laughs> he's a brutal. He said he's insecure, so he flexes his money on the people. Rod Wave is isn't fat, just full of lyrics. <laughs> That's insane. So, you know, hey. 
<laughs> laughing at these fuck niggas all year, man. They turn laugh, they trip. It looks like you're tripping to me, mate. That's the face of someone that's tripping. When someone says I ain't tripping and they've got that sort of face, that's a tripping face. Again, who knows? L- l- these things happen in, in life, innit? So big up Broadway. Hopefully he um, gets healthy. He probably won't because, you know, why Why bother getting healthy if you're making that much money being the way he looks or being being the size that you are at that time? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would you do that? Why fix? Why try and fix something that, is, that isn't broken? That's what I say. But hey, what do I know? So, of course, as most of my UK listeners are aware, we are now in a second lockdown, the UK wide, right? We're going to, well, yeah, we're heading into a second lockdown. Um, by the time you probably hear this, we're heading into a second lockdown from Thursday onward. Um, no real surprise, really, considering how shockingly bad our government and us as a people have basically dealt with the coronavirus we haven't necessarily gone out of our way to with abstain from going out and you know doing the things that are necessarily going to spread it the the wearing of masks is sporadic to say the least depending on what area you go in depending on the socioeconomic level of it depending on the um you know on the racial um identity of the area it also depends on how people often are people going to wear masks and of course you have the covid deniers who always are going to exist but more importantly i think the real issue at hand is the mixed messages from the government right is a sort of um in between actions in terms of like are we going to do something or are we not do we take the full action do we go on a full lockdown or do we kind of prevent certain places from opening it's a complete shit show of a situation no real idea as to when we're going to leave as to when we're going to get out of the lockdown as to when we're going to learn to some sort of normality unfortunately and um yeah we're just all kind of hanging on really and sort of hoping things get better um sometime soon i don't know when but so far, there isn't no real end in sight. So this is an article from Sky News that says coronavirus. Uh, you're going to enter a month-long lockdown from Thursday, the PM announces. Um, he says, until um, until December 2nd, people in England will only be allowed to leave their homes for specific reasons, which as education, work or food uh, shopping. Mr. Johnson, speaking at Downing Street News Conference on Saturday evening, said there was no alternative to a second period of national lockdown restrictions. Um, he said the Prime Minister urged the country to return to its spring measures to stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives, acknowledged that the Christmas is going to be a different this year. However, Mr. Johnson suggested that tough action now could now could allow families to be tight together over the festive period. Mr. Johnson said that no, no, no responsible Prime Minister could ignore the rising number of coronavirus infections across England. And he warned that without action, there would be a greater number of COVID-19 deaths this winter than during the spring's first week of the pandemic, which ironically was a time that they were telling us to go and enjoy our summer holidays, travel to neighbouring countries, eat out to help out and all this other manner of nonsense. Anyway, it continues. Um, schools, colleges and universities will remain open, while those who cannot work from home, such as workers in the construction and manufacturing, will be encouraged to continue going to their workplaces. Pubs, bars and restaurants will close across the country, although they'll be able to offer takeaway and delivery services. Non-essential shops, hairdressers and leisure and entertainment venues will also be shut. The Prime Minister said the furlough scheme, which has seen the government pay a portion of people's wages during the COVID-19 crisis, but was due to end on Saturday, could now be extended through November, which is fine funny um especially well not funny but you know funny in terms of the um ineptitude of the government that they decided to extend furlough after they decided to end it and most companies have already made necessary adjustments to let go of certain people because they can't support or put or cover their wages with the government scheme of furlough it's just Typical of us, isn't it? It continues here. Different households will be banned from mixing. All the support bubbles and childcare bubbles will remain and childcare will still be able to move uh, between homes if their parents are separated. And then the most important thing and the most hurtful thing for myself, of course, gyms will be shut, but people continue to exercise for unlimited periods outdoors, whether they're with people from their own household or one-to-one basis with one person from another household. Great. The one thing that was sort of holding myself and others together, the one thing that was giving us some sort of level of structure and idea of what to do day to day, gyms, has now been taken away from us. Great. You know, great. Great, 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 great. What can you do in it? 
What can you do? I can rant and rave about it, but I'm not bothered really. Um, as tired, I'm, I am bothered, sorry, but I just don't think I can uh, affect any sort of change, any meaningful way. All I can do is just to advise those that are on the fence about the virus that, you know, even if you're not a believer in it, try your best to abstain from going out and doing stupid things just so we can all return back to a level of normality because i got the this is something i mean about the playgraves i understand them right i get the need to go out and rave and do your thing especially when you've been um told you can't natural reactions to go and do it anyway but now that we're going to be in this prolonged period in time under some sort of lockdown and restrictions in terms of doing the things that we enjoy it probably makes sense that everyone sort of like chips in and sort of like unites in order to make this thing, in order to sort of be past this time as quickly as possible. Because we've heard now news recently that supposedly, um, what did they say? Even when we come out of this four week or lockdown until the 2nd of December, there's no guarantee that we're going to go back to level three or level or tier two, whatever nonsense that we're on, right? It could still be reviewed and then maybe extended until the new year, which I'm most, which I'm kind of, uh, I have the, you know, the pessimistic side of me thinks most likely they'll probably extend it through to a new year. There's no point in having people essentially locked down for a month and then allowing them to go out before Christmas when, you know, not, you know, usually Christmas holidays in the UK are a complete shit show in terms of people getting absolutely slaughtered. So I can't assume they would want that to happen again, especially with COVID in the air. So they're most likely going to tell us it's going to be open or back to normal to some no level on the 2nd of December. Then when that comes around, they'll say the numbers are too high and they'll continue keeping us under some level of restrictions, whether it's a tier four, a tier three, regardless, that will continue to new year. So if that's the case, we really do owe it to ourselves, especially us young people who they're blaming for everything out there to kind of... Uh, put our best foot forward and make sure that we don't um, make this time under lockdown any longer or any more excruciating than it needs to be really um, it's been difficult for myself right I'm a, a night owl right I'm a nighttime aficionado my you know I come to life outdoors in a cold queue somewhere um, waiting to go into some nondescript warehouse party to see some nobody play techno for four hours and then make you know 25 best friends in the toilets like that's what I do that's my life but I guess now it's not I have to put down pause as everyone else has and I guess the best way that we can kind of deal with the situation is that we all band around and try and make the best of it help work you know work with each other help each other so that we can return to some normality on the other side of things that's my only hope because if we don't this government is going to just keep you know rinsing and repeating this whole lockdown regional lockdown national lockdown thing until the until there's a basic vaccine they don't necessarily look like they have any idea what they're doing in that regard which is frustrating but i guess somewhat understandable if you know how governments work in it but anyway moving on moving on from that level of politics into something a little bit more funny um i'm not too sure why this happened or when this happened or if this is uh a calculated thing or something that he actually truly believes in but for some reason little pump has turned into a bit of a trump fan um within the last week or so i'm not too sure what the reason is behind it again i'm not too sure if it's a clever marketing strategy from the people that can handle him and you know are in charge of you know uh making sure they cultivate an image for him because like it like his music or not the people that are behind little pump and making him a thing they're expert marketeers right in terms of where they place him the things that he does the antics he gets up on social but it feels like in recent years the antics haven't necessarily garnered the traction that he w once did in the past right flamethrowers fighting and having girls fight each other lighting people's hair on fire weird challenges jumping into swimming pools there's only so much of that you can do on the ground before people just kind of turn off and you have to keep up the ante right um bonk gang kind of fell into that sort of trap right having to you know constantly sort of outdo yourself in order to kind of get that sort of um viral hit in your veins so maybe this is another alternative option for Lil Pump to go to these Trump rallies, declare himself a uh, a Trump fan, declare himself a MAGA acolyte, put on the hat and, you know, stir up some controversy online. Now, the funny thing is, is that I think Lil Pump is so irrelevant in terms of his musical career now that there's pretty much nothing he can do to revive it. No, no, he could, he, he could, you could read a story of him supposedly hooking up with Rihanna and it wouldn't do anything for his musical career. No one gives a crap and it's sad to see because 
I still think there's a lot of potential in the kid. No, of course, he's not going to be the next J. Cole, which is ironic because J. Cole gave him that chat. But there is a lot of potential there, but he's never really actualized it. Maybe because, you know, he got too rich too quickly. But there's definitely still an artist there in him. But, you know, now this is basically what he's resorted himself to, to going on, to go into Trump rallies and trying to wind up his fan base of kids who quite possibly don't give a single scooby fuck about politics of course you got Jorge Mazda out there for his own um unspecified reason i've really necessarily looked into but it's interesting isn't it interesting that that's the approach to kind of revive your career to go to a trump rally um hang around with donald trump juniors i think fiance this lady here and you know um and try and get that what maga base to buy your albums again i don't know what that's about but <sighs> interesting tactic whether it would work or not we're gonna have to wait and see um elections what coming up very very soon in it so we'll guess we'll get an indication on whether that happens or not where is actually little pump's arm in this video clip because if you're interested to, if, what, how funny would it be if little pump ended up hooking up with Don, <laughs> donald trump jr's missus <laughs> it would end up in some sort of sordid love affair that would be hilarious isn't it that would be utterly utterly hilarious but yeah Big up little pump, I guess. You have to do what you have to do to keep the lights on. COVID is around. He's not making any money from shows, which I assume, you know, like most artists was a big portion of his income. So, you know, if you if you need to rile up your base of kids who probably don't know who any of these people are in this picture anyway, apart from Jorge Masvidal, I guess that works for you. Um, again, interesting approach um, from him. And we'll see how that affects his album sales going forward. I don't think it's going to probably do that much. Maybe he's, do you think he's going to license? Can you, like, what what song can of Little Pump's catalog can he license for a Trump rally, right? Because they always need, like, I'm a champion or, you know, whatever, some sort of rousing song that kind of uplifts the, uplifts the crowd. But I know I used to listen to Little Pump when he's got to the gym, right? It's great music to kind of get a bump on. No irony, uh, no pun intended there. But what sort of tune could you play at a Trump rally to get, you know, middle American mums to get turned and hyped to see uh, big old, uh, the big orange man come on stage. Not many, innit? Probably too many curse words, uh, too derogatory against women, all that stuff, blah, 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 blah. But who knows? Who knows? What do I know? I'm just a lowly, lowly guy. Um, anyway, continuing on, we have um, just observations because I just, I actually finished listening to it the other day. Um, Alex Jones, Tim Dillon, on the Joe Rogan podcast, um, episode number one five 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 was available. Was I think it was, was it streaming live? Yeah, I feel no, it wasn't streaming live. It was available on YouTube though. I think it, I thought it was being streamed live, but it wasn't. But my conclusion after watching that podcast is that Joe Rogan is a hell of a friend. Say what you want about him as a person, especially in recent years, he's kind of you know some people have had some um, valid concerns about the way he's conducted himself, but. Considering his level of success, considering his level of influence, considering his level of quote unquote power, he's a pretty decent human being, isn't it? And I say that because he decided after all the pushback he's gotten for signing with Spotify, for the people in Spotify, for, you know, kicking up a bit of a fuss, fuss mainly online about him getting the deal, people in Hollywood, obviously upset that he got the money mostly due to jealousy the fact that alex jones is persona non grata in the scene in the industry in general um considering you know his volatile nature and their somewhat um tetchy relationship over the years for joe rogan to decide hey you're gonna go on my show i don't give a shit um is such a great f you moment or f you money moment that you definitely have to give the guy credit you definitely have to give him credit and again i know a lot of people are happy with the alex jones episode because joe rogan was essentially fact checking um alex jones throughout the entire thing but i didn't necessarily think it was a bad thing if anything i thought he was looking out for his friend somebody he's known for what more than a decade and he was trying to um humanize him in a way where he was um, inadvertently telling the public who weren't necessarily sold on Alex Jones that hey I know this guy says some crazy wacky shit I know he did he said that shit about Sandy Hook which essentially tanked his career and he said some other dubious things along the way but he is right a lot of the times too some of the stuff that he mentions I was though crazy as it does seem or as it seemed back then especially now because conspiracy theories have gotten a lot more tame nowadays right you can definitely understand the rationale behind a lot more conspiracy theories than you might have done a few years ago so I think Jericho did a really good way did a really good um 
thing by getting Alex Jones on the show. And of course, having Tim Dillon on there as a counter really helped. He's a big fan of Alex. He's obviously very well versed in the world of conspiracies too, and is quite politically um, knowledgeable in that respect. So that that definitely helped to move the conversation on. And the hours just flew by, man. Honestly, a really, really good um, appearance by Alex. Probably would have needed or would, could have been helped with having Joe be able to smoke a bit. I think, you know, this was, I think, towards the tail end of Sober October, so he couldn't obviously have any drugs or alcohol except for a cigar that he was smoking, um, which probably might have broken the rules, but hey, who am I to tell him what he's doing? But that probably might have helped Joe to settle down somewhat, but I think it was definitely helped by having Tim Dillon in the room. He kind of helped to ease some of the tension. Um, and throughout, we probably, we probably got to saw Alex Jones in his best light so far, I think, post his, well, he's kind of, you know, um, platform-wide censorship. Um, and again, say what you want about the dude, but being, you know, these tech platforms having the ability to essentially delete you from the public conversation is maddening, isn't it? And the fact that no one batted an eyelid, no one, again, say what you want about what he says, but this idea that it only is going to affect somebody like an Alex Jones, especially seeing what's happened with the New York Post regarding the Hunter Biden story that's been buried. It's just a really sad state of affairs. But again, great appearance i think alex got a lot out of it um of course he's been welcomed back into the joe universe he's uh, supposed to be going to appear on their election special live stream that they're going to be doing in a couple of days time so that should be pretty cool and again one of my probably favorite alex jones appearances on joe Rogan podcast i think they did an incredibly good job uh together i think it sort of worked out well the balance of them three in there but I'd love to know your thoughts. What did you think of these appearances? Did you think Alex Jones did a good job? Did you think he was wacky wacky? Or did you think um, Joe was right in terms of pulling him up on the fact checks? Let me know in the comments down below. What's next here? Oh, this is one. Yeah, talking about politics. So, talking about politics. So, this is um taken from The Fire and the Kid, episode number 616. And essentially, it's Brendan Shaw declaring that he will be voting for Donald Trump in the upcoming election. Now, it's not necessarily a don't Brendan Shaw issue this, but more so a question to people in general, especially people in the States. Do you really care or does it really bother you at all when people that you follow, or people that you look up to vote, um, um, vote for somebody that you're not going to vote for? or have kind of opposing political views to your own. I know it's different now in the in the States because things are so tense in the US, it feels like um, you're on a knife edge. I think whoever wins, you know, Biden or Trump, I don't think either of the losing team is going to go out quietly, right? Um, you know, of course, race relations are all time high uh, or racial tensions, it feels like, especially on the internet. Um, the stuff that's happening in Portland is a madness. Like there's so many things happening, so many layers uh, of stuffs. Of course, Hollywood has been thrown into complete disarray. Celebrities are freaking out online, don't know what to do with their free time. They're stripping naked, telling you to vote. They're doing all sorts of nonsense. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, but I would like to know like what happens when you hear somebody you look up to and they come out and say, oh, I'm voting for that guy who you completely hate. Do you delete all their content and stuff that you're a fan of them of or because in Europe it's different because we just don't talk about politics openly that like cause as much as Americans do right um, it's sort of something you kind of keep private or to yourself or to a select group of people that you kind of speak about those things too but it seems like in the US everyone just flings around or wears very proudly whatever party affiliations they're with even if they're not you know an active you know even if they're not kind of actively participating in politics they're sort of where whatever party they're supporting very proudly in their chest you know on their bumper stickers whatever it may be so i wonder if this is a bigger deal in the states than it would be in the uk because i know if somebody i looked at in the uk came out and was a tory i wouldn't necessarily give a shit right um as long as i get the creative output that i've kind of known that i've kind of come to expect from that person and the quality doesn't sort of kind of like yeah it's a dave rubin thing i can remain a fan of dave rubin even if you support somebody that I don't support politically, as long as the show remains good, right? The moment the show level starts to decrease or the message starts to get muddied, or I feel like he's kind of grifting and trying to, you know, play up to that base and the work suffers, that's when I'm out. That's kind of my mark on it. But let's see what Brendan Shaw has to say regarding his opinion on Trump and the up and coming elections. Ele elections. Elections. I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Typical that I'd kind of mud muddle up my words when I'm playing a Brendan Shaw clip, innit? <laughs> it's contagious. But anyway, let's see what he has to say. 
you hear him talk about Trump and funding, you're like, oh, like the he military makes sense. funding. He makes sense. It'll make you just be like, oh, fuck. It'll just make you think, you know? Because, like, with me, with voting, it's all about me personally. Like, certain people are going to vote on things that's important to them, whether, you know, it's not, I, I don't like Trump or Biden. I don't like either guy. Copy that. So for me, what affects me is their tax laws, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to vote based off tax laws. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest tax cut for me would be Trump, right? But how big is the tax break really? Because I've looked into a bit of it and it doesn't really, again, this is me talking from an outsider's perspective, but it seems like it falls within the 5 to 12% bracket in terms of, you know, the difference between both guys. I guess I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, Biden has one of those tax things where you only get taxed a certain amount. You only get taxed a certain percentage if you earn up to a certain amount, right? That sort of conf confusing thing that he does. And I guess Trump has got a bit more of a blanket, easy to read. If you've got money, I'm not going to tax you a high sort of idea behind it. But I wonder if that's, if any of you guys know, can kind of lend more credence to what he's talking about here. So but with Biden's plan, it's crazy. Mm. But when you hear in Trump's, uh, funding towards the military. Well, I'm going to vote for that too because I believe in a strong military. Mm. So when you hear Tim Kenny talk about it, mm. and he goes, you know, you can vote for you want because as far as military go, they're going to be a lot of them are pro Trump because when Obama was in uh, office, he was very reserved, wasn't given the military funding, and ISIS kind of flourished, started popping up all. And to borrow a very apt used uh, Kanye quote, you know. Brennan's got a lot of cool shoes. He knows a bit about MMA, but what the hell does he know about the military? Why would the military um, spending be a deciding factor in his choice for who's the next president of the United States? The tax thing I kind of get, right? He's newly rich. He's got some money. He wants to keep the money. It is what it is. But the military thing, like, what was somebody in his family in the military? Did he serve? I, I, I don't know what's this. Or maybe that's an American thing again. Like, do, do people vote based... Like, if you were going to vote for a candidate, wouldn't it be vote? Wouldn't you vote on them based on the things that actually impact you in some way, shape, or form? Whether you had, you know, you came from a military family or you served yourself, um, but just, you know, just being a guy and just deciding I'm going to vote for this guy because he's going to spend more on the military is very bizarre, especially considering what's going on in the world. But hey, I don't know. All over, it was Trump came in, gave us the funding, mm -hmm. and what he says released the hounds. Was like, yeah, there's gonna be some casualties, but do what you want to beat ISIS. You know how long it took our special forces to beat ISIS? Mm -hmm. Three months. That's a again. I'm not very politically minded, but I'm assuming that's a very oversimplification of a very complex issue that probably was not the, you know, not one person can sit there and say, oh yeah, I was the one responsible for defeating ISIS. I think every president sort of like, um, you know since maybe ISIS inception played some sort of role in eventually defeating them. And I would assume just things changing. Um, other people getting involved, deaths, I don't know. I'm sure it's just not just Trump giving them more money and that's why they defeated ISIS. That's a very rah-rah sort of like, you know, um, America sort of way of looking at things. I'd imagine. Maybe I'm not right. I don't know. Three months. Instead of the four years with Obama, with the proper funding and capabilities, our military's the baddest on earth. It took them three months. Mm. Shout out to Ears Ears. That makes me proud to be American. Ears, Ears. That's ISIS. I, but if you, why shout you don't want to shout out to ISIS. <laughs> why are you shouting out ISIS? <laughs> Can we edit that? No, because yeah, yeah. no, we defeated no, we that part. Yeah. No, we defeated that no, 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 Nah, I'm with the military. No, no shout out to ISIS. No, 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 no shout out. Also, if you... So, yeah. Um, Shorb is a Trump fan. It, we, it shouldn't be surprising, really. I think we've heard him sort of like dancing around that a few times. Um, it definitely goes a long way. It definitely says a lot more about the show that he's starting to say this sort of stuff now. Um, you know, the show's obviously waning um, due to all the other controversies that have sort of surrounded it with Brent, with sorry, with Brian Callen's, um sexual assault allegations and whatnot. And obviously, I'm assuming that is that article still going to come out regarding the comedy scene that someone in, in, in the Los Angeles Times was threatening to publish. If that's true, everyone's still on tender hooks. Everyone's still sort of like on their, you know still sort of uh, watching their shoulders and making sure they um, don't get themselves in necessary trouble. But there's also the aspect of making sure that people click on your videos and, you know, um, comment and stir sort of controversy up. And I think, you know, sometimes maybe dipping your feet in the political landscape, especially in America, is a great way to sort of get engagement and get people to contact and sort of like, you know, throw hate your way. Personally, I think the show's probably been 
dealt a bit of a lifeline with the addition of um what's his name Malik and Chappelle I think they've been great additions to the show so much so I think this was actually I watched that show in four and I really enjoyed it I think that was probably one of the better ones they've done in a while um the chemistry between the the three of them is getting a little bit better Brendan's still a little bit tetchy it feels like he doesn't necessarily know how to talk to black people that well but that's just a, my reading from the outside he doesn't banter that well with them um he doesn't he gets a little bit uncomfortable when they sort of like do their own inside jokes and they sort of laugh hysterically like you know black guys do in general um he doesn't know really what to do himself but he's he's slowly getting there and i think um they've sort of been helped with their sort of like laid back laissez-faire jovial attitude the fact that they're still getting there you know they're still finding their feet in the comedy scene is probably lended itself to being good and the fact that they're not necessarily trying to compete for the number one spot on the show right because we said it's brendan show he's the top dog in the room so i think that sort of helps with the balance but the show isn't what it was in it there's no denying the show was better when brian callum was on it even towards the end when brian was being a real misery guts and they were sort of like quietly hating each other the show's not as good as it was prior it definitely isn't it probably will never return to that because you know things have just changed um i'm sure brendan's priorities have changed so has brian's he's basically been stung and burnt and basically he's, he's kind of been um embracing them sort of like spat back out again isn't it it seems like no one that he sort of worked with on a big scale has kind of come out to back him and lend the support publicly in the way that you saw happen to um what's his face um the guy that was on oh what's his bloody face the first one that doesn't matter it doesn't matter anyway but no one's really supported brian in a way that they probably he probably would have envisioned to so this is the show now isn't it t5k um or the fire and the kids uh, as they've sort of like kind of rebranded it where brendan Schaub sits there and lectures two black guys about why he's going to vote for trump because um he gives them good tax breaks so he can buy more jordans and porsches and he's really kind to the military which he's never been in bizarre bizarre times we live in but what can we do in it? We've got to live the way we all live in it. But yeah, let me know in the comments down below. Is this a normal thing that people do? Just talk about politics openly with friends and stuff in general. Um, would you care if somebody you looked up to, you know, had opposing political views to you? I'd love to know in the comments down below. Okay, next on the list, what do we have here? What do we have here? okay here so um this is just an observation about um the difficult like the kind of difficulty there is in streetwear to really get in collaborations right and sort of like the inability of some bigger companies to hit them at the park even when they have all the resources and they sort of have everything on paper to kind of make a success it just doesn't work out um, it's Ramoa, right? The you know the famous luxury luggage company, you know that you kind of know and you're aware of. You know they're kind of uh, signature aluminium steel carry-on luggage uh, bag that everyone sort of you know you've probably seen in the airport somewhere with somebody you know um, that sort of is highfalutin or from some level of tax and income that you're probably not aware of, but you know very influential, very. Uh, legendary bat luggage company known for making durable luggage that is essentially indestructible and it seems like in the last few years they've pivoted and tried you know they've made a concerted effort to infiltrate or to kind of gain some market share in the global youth market right the young travelers who are location independent uh, people who attend people who do what's that hair and on t-shirt people who do the influence of world tour right where what is it it's um it's the moma show it's moma it's fashion weeks it's miami art basel right they do that sort of thing so it's trying to obviously market to those type of people now of course the issue is those people are a very small portion of the general clients or customers that they have coming in their store you know day in day out they don't represent the large majority of people that buy that luggage and considering the indestructible nature of the luggage and how well made it's how well made they are it's very unrealistic to expect back people to buy remora luggage every season right once you buy one you don't really need to buy another especially if you've got one in each size right there's no need to kind of update them uh, if you keep kind of good care of them and they do what they say on a tin so they've got this really odd conundrum where they're trying to market a brand that's durable and long lasting to a clientele who wants the newest freshest thing every season how do you do that 
So now Romerov tried to answer that call by designing these crossbody luggage bags, obviously taking inspiration from their luggage, and they look fucking terrible. The, the, the photo shoot itself, the clothing worn by the model, the lighting and the pictures are just terrible from the top to the bottom. And just another indication of just, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter how many connections they have. And you look at Ramoa, they're owned by LVMH. The kid that's running it, I think, is the son of, um, you know, whatever the main dude is at LVMH, right? He's very plugged into everybody in the scene. Um, you know, I'm sure most people would, you know, fall over themselves to get a collaboration or to get an in with LBMH working with Ramoa. So everything's set up for them for, to win, but it just isn't working at all. And this shoot showing their crossbody bags is another indication of just how terribly bad and how, e how terribly easy it is to execute really bad ideas. But look at this. It looks shockingly bad. So they made these little pouch bag things that look like the luggage. It's just... Ugh. This is styling on the actual images themselves, just terrible. So it continues. Under Alexander Alno's purview, again, that's the son. Um, and Ramoa has transformed from a heritage luggage into a bona fide trendsetter. Mm, not really, though, has it? A signature aluminium case is now a status symbol, no less covetable to the monogram laden bags devised by LVMH Maisons. For fall winter 2020, the brand has issued a miniature crossbody irritation. Um, uh, ir iteration sorry of a signature rigid um rigid ridged suitcase reimagining it as a crossbody shoulder bag dubbed the personal case <sighs> so so dead like how shit does this look like who's gonna wear that you'd love to think there's some sort of product marketing uh market research went into making these bags right identifying you know some pain points for remote customers and things that they're missing in their wardrobe and lineup of bags but this just looks shocking um it continues to first seen um in the dior spring 2020 collection the german made bags are crafted in polycarbonate rather than rigid aluminium to make it lighter weight and wearable in boss remote branding the miniature bag features a lengthy adjustable strap that can be removed to modify into a clutch now I understand the need to change the materials to something more lightweight, but isn't there an argument to be had for if you're going to put out the first bits of these personal luggages that take personal bags, is that what they're called, right? Personal case, so they take inspiration from the actual mainline luggage. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more of a reason to, you know, to bring out the first ones with the actual aluminium casing that you're kind of known for? But that would make more sense in it instead of making them you know instead of making the first ones to drop these polycarbonate hybrids but what do i know in boss with remote branding the minute bag features a lengthy adjustable strap that can be removed to modify into a clutch the two leather band secure the case and ensure it doesn't pop open in transit while leather lining cradles its contents the debut collection will see the personal offered um in shades of white black plus seasonal shades of desert rose and cactus look at for now available on december 3rd it's just so bad isn't it and again it's just interesting to see de depend especially when you think about um the rolodex of contacts alexander alner has in his phone book in terms of who you can get to make this pop off and so far the only memorable item i can remember from remoas from this new remoa era um that they're trying to spearhead is of course what virgil did with his off-white case the clear case that was a genius move and then the supreme collaboration they've been pretty decent right that spider print they did they obviously the first one with the massive s on it or the massive soup written on the side that was pretty cool but you know the bags were very well regarded regardless the luggage cases um doing a collaboration with supreme isn't going to take him anywhere you know it's not going to take them to another level they've got a dedicated fan base of customers that are always going to buy their luggage regardless so it doesn't necessarily do anything and the kids that do get one supreme luggage aren't going to then go get 17 others are they that's just my opinion on it but yeah, it doesn't look that inspiring. The shoot itself looks terrible, considering the brands that they have at LVMH. The style of shoot like that looks, you know, pretty shocking. Something that they, it looks like a shoot that you decide to do just before you go out for staff drinks on a Friday. Oh yeah, yeah cool. You just, you beckon over the prettiest girl on your team and you, you know, you tell her to wear a skirt that's been lying around for ages and then you just, you know, sum it up like that shoot there. That's, those boots, that skirt, that color tone of the bag, the shirt, the frumpiness, of it, it's just all shocking. And again, me no stylist, right? But I know what looks good and what doesn't. And that looks terrible. Absolutely shocking. But again, 
maybe I'm wrong in it. Would you wear one of these um, Ramoa personal bags, crossbody bags? Is this is would this kind of replace your Gucci pouch, your Armani pouch? I don't necessarily think so, but maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to know in the comments down below. Anyway, that's the Excellent Zing Show episode number 396. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time watching the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. That is always welcome. And as per usual, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.